Gehenna. Uh, it's all very unfortunate, but what I see is that it's the image of God establishes all these things. If we understand, you know, kind of what God looks like, if you will, um, then all these other things begin to fall into place. It's not just that God created this place called hell and he can hardly wait to throw sinners into it, you know, that you so often hear and people are like, I don't get hell. Why would God create this place? You know, even I am like, well, that's just a really bummer, you know. I mean, I don't like the doctrine of hell any more than the other guy does. But when I understand the image of God, what God looks like, what God is like, now I'm like, oh, so everything is going to be laid bare. There's no place to hide in the world to come. You're either for God or you're, you're against God. If you're for God, you have a body, you've got your wedding garment on, and it's, it's, it's a body that is suited to be there with him. And his glory is not going to do you in, but you're going to be like, give me more. I like this glory. This is great. And I even believe that, um, that as in the way that God created us, we, uh, we have things that are called biophotons. And biophotons, it's in our very DNA. DNA, uh, I mean, that's really what a bio, it, the biophoton is, is that DNA absorbs and emits light. It absorbs and emits light. And um, did we talk about this last time I was on? I, you know, I can't remember. I'm no, th this is this. But, uh, usually, I'm I'm up to speed with everything you're talking about, at least sort of, kind of. But the bio photons, I'm like, wow, that is cool. I've never heard of this before. Yeah, bio photons were uh, actually uh, something that was dis were discovered by a guy named. Um, let me just pull up his name. I, I can never remember the guy's name, but it's Gevercht, uh, Ukrainian biologist Alexander G uh, Gervicht, I hope I pronounce that correctly, in 1923. And he discovered that, you know, things like onions and yeast uh, were, were producing this ultra weak photon emission. And this has been um, the, the same uh, scenario has been replicated and, and reproduced by many other. Uh, scientists from then. So th the whole study of bio biophotonics is not really well known, but it is well established. And what they've uh, what they've very uh, concretely established is that um, um, biophotons are, are light that is given off by any uh, DNA, by all DNA. So all living things, which of course have DNA in them, will absorb light, but they're also giving off light. And with, uh, you know, today we can only see it using machines. But what's fascinating is that the Bible actually speaks to this. If you remember, I, I mentioned that Moses went up on top of the mountain for 40 days and nights, and he came down and his face was actually shining light. How could it be that his face was shining God's light? Well, he, so he's up there with the ultimate light source, which is God himself. And this light is going into him. And his DNA is storing it. And then when he comes down, he's re-emitting that light. Now, just like if I were to take a little you know, glow-in-the-dark sticker and put it underneath the light, it's going to glow for a little while, but eventually it's going to go out. But if, if that little glow-in-the-dark sticker were continuously in the light, it would forever glow. You know, unless until it, you know, it kind of <laughs> putters out. But here God has created us so that we would absorb his light and then re-emit that light so that we would essentially glow. And we find that in a number of places in scripture. We find that, uh, first of all, in Daniel 12, where uh, Daniel is told, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Jesus said the same thing. He said in Matthew 13, 43, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. And then we, we basically see this uh, uh, played out in the book of Revelation 19, verse 8. And it says, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. 
So the word there for clean and bright, the word bright is the, the Greek word lampros. So it has to do with the light, you know, some kind of a shining. So we're going to have this, this fine linen, clean and bright, shining and resplendent. It's going to shine forth. Now what I find interesting, it says, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And I think that takes us back all the way to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So if, you know, I've done things for the Lord, which are gold, silver, and, and precious stones, then those things are going to be tested by fire, and they're going to last. The things that I did for me uh, are going to be burned away uh, at the beginning of my stay in, in God's presence. So... Here in Revelation 19, uh, obviously the Lord's bride uh, has already been purified in a sense. Uh, the, the, the dross has been burned away and uh, she's been made ready. She's been prepared. Uh, fascinating. The, very, the verse right before it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Could that be a reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Uh, I would suggest yes, and that her garments have been uh, completely washed as clean as can be, and any you know dark spots that we had when we first get to uh, up to, to heaven are going to be just burned away. So anyway, these biophotons, you know, Moses is up there, he comes down, his face is glowing, but it eventually goes away. But how much greater to think about when we're in God's presence, we're going to be there, we're going to absorb his light, and then we're going to re-emit it as what would appear to be our own light. But really, the ultimate light source is God himself. So, yeah, I get kind of excited about this, you know, because uh, I think uh, this, is, this is exciting stuff. And when you begin to understand, you know, just who God is, kind of what he looks like. You know, and I'm, not, I'm not saying I understand everything about God. I certainly don't. And I'm not saying that I completely understand the image of God. I don't. But what I do understand is what he told me. He's told me what he looks like, and I'm going to take those literally and accept them as these are true. It's not just anthropomorphic language, as many would like it to be, but it's God actually telling us what he looks like. And I think it changes a lot. It brings into focus a lot of what we see in Scripture. I'm here, buddy. I'm just kind of glowing off of you and what we've <laughs> learned tonight. Um, this is I say it's, it's it's such a joy to be. I know you're busy, but you you know you're always able to to come through about once a month and be with us. And it is such a joy, man. Thank you. Um, I, I've got about four pages of notes here tonight that I've taken, and uh, and, and it's a what I'll call a quiet topic, but man, at the end of it, I just feel such a joy and an encouragement from it, and mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really great. And it's funny because. I was writing down, as you were beginning uh, to speak on all of this, I was writing down the finger of God, the hand of God, the arm of God, and I couldn't remember the fancy theological phrase that I learned in Bible college, which of course is anthropomorphic. But uh, And then you started talking about it, and I just started to laugh. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Bible talks about Daniel and that there will be further revelation, or seal the book up until the, you know, the end times and people mm -hmm. will understand it more. And, you know, with yourself and Daniel Duvall and a few others that are in the circle of folks the Lord has allowed me to meet, you know, I see men that are earnest students of the Word and bringing such wonderful revelation of God to us. Nothing that is, um, you know, counter to standard, solid theology, but just more and more. And being a Christian, you know, I'm a grand old man of 50 uh, years and 11 months and I've been a Christian since 1983 and I gotta tell you Doug it's more exciting to be a Christian today than it was you know 30 years ago it, it really is mm. and I'm learning more now than I was then and part of that is is uh, are people like you and I'm not trying to give you a fat head but I, I don't know what kind of abuse and and, um, and uh, criticism and, and just you know crap you have to deal with, but I want to give you some genuine and honest encouragement um, and gratitude. You know, you've encouraged a bunch of people here tonight. 
I'm going to throw this up on YouTube. Who knows how many people will watch it there. But, uh, you know, this kind of stuff does touch people's lives and does make a difference. So um, I, I pray yeah, it's, that, it's, that it's I can exciting. be an encouragement yeah, to and, you. I, and, I've, you know, good. I appreciate the, the feedback. I'll, I'll, I'll accept it. Uh, you know, sometimes you kind of feel like are people are going to get the rope out and, uh, you know, take me, yeah. take me aside because I'm suggesting these things. But, you know, my goal is just to take the Bible as as straightforward and literally as I possibly can. And I think that sometimes we we start talking in theological circles when we say, well, it doesn't really mean that, you know, it doesn't really mean that. But I think if we'll just give these things time and say, okay, Lord, how can it be that this thing is actually literal? I mean, I take your word, it sure looks like a figure of speech, but Lord, could this thing be literal? Is there something I don't quite get yet? Yeah. And I think that as we, we meditate on that and just rest in that, the Lord begins to show us these things. I mean, I can't tell you how much I was praying as I was writing this book. You know, I just started writing these things and you know, I'm doing this research and I'm like, Lord, is this, is, is this really what you're telling me? I mean, I mean I'm seeing and hearing your word, but are these the right conclusions? You know, and I just kept praying about this because, you know, I feel that I've you know, maybe I'm sacrificing a few sacred cows. And, um, you know, that, that's somewhat scary because I know that, you know, we can all get entrenched in our own traditions. Sure. And we feel fairly comfortable in those traditions that we want to, you know, basically stick with those. And so here, uh, you know, I just really saw that the Lord was showing me things. And, uh, you know, I got excited about it. I mean, I've got several other verses. I've got 1 John 3, 2. Where John says, "Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we shall. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is." Uh, Ephesians four twenty four, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Philippians three twenty one, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to himself. And uh, we see in, in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Uh, 3, verse 10, and you and have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. I mean, it just, it goes on and on. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's so exciting to see what what the Lord has done. I've got also Second uh, Peter one four, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I mean, we're going to be partakers of the divine nature. My goodness. So you know what this does? It sets the foundation of what the Lord has in store for us. And then you begin to compare and contrast that with what the enemy is trying to do. And, and that's why I really laid this foundation in my book. And, uh, you know, some people suggest that I should, you know, get rid of a, a few chapters because it's too much for the average guy, you know. But I thought, you know, I, I really believe that there's a foundation that we need to establish. Because once you see these things, once you understand the image of God, how God created us in that image, how it has been corrupted. And of course, you know what the Lord did to fix it. You're like, wow, that's great. But of course, many people don't believe that. And so, you know, what is what is humanity sort of, you know, in a big general global sense longing for? Well, they're longing for no more disease. They're longing for uh, longevity of life, if not immortality. They're longing for powers beyond what we have. Uh, they're longing for greater knowledge. Uh, lots of things. And, you know, of course, we can start looking uh, out there to see, you know, if you take it a few steps further, uh, you know, people that are in the new age, they're looking forward to this quantum leap that's coming in someday. Hmm. They're looking forward to these bodies of light. The convergence. Uh, that the new age, yeah, the, the new age so often talks about. Uh, you know, the people that are channeling with the 
the quote unquote aliens, which are demons, mm. uh, you know, they're being promised all these superpowers. They're being promised uh, bodies of light. They're being promised immortality. These are all things that the Lord wants to give us. He wants you to have that body of light, but not through the, you know, not through the deceiver, but you've got to come through the door. You've got to come through the, the only way that you're going to truly get it, which is through Jesus Christ. Everything else is, is a sham. It, it, it's, it's just utter deceit. It's, you know, it's a scam. Don't go there, you know, buyer beware. Uh, I think the Lord would want us to know, don't go there. It, it's going to end in pain and misery. So don't do that. And so, you know, he'll give you these things for free. You know, I found it really fascinating that uh, there was something, I forget the, the technical term, but uh, basically post-Avatar depression. You know, people would go see the movie Avatar and then they would get really, de really depressed. And, uh, you know, the, the theory goes that 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 world in the movie Avatar was so beautiful that uh, they basically didn't like to come back to this reality. Hmm. And I can I can sort of understand that. I mean, I thought you know the the story was you know ho hum, but but the cinematography and the special effects of that movie were simply breathtaking. I mean, I I was enthralled by the beauty of that world, and and it really strikes me. I'm like you know here the enemy is using this movie to to captivate people's hearts so that they are they're longing and yearning for such a beautiful world and yet the lord wants to give us those things hmm. and then when i begin to think about biophotonics i'm like oh my goodness <laughs> you know we're going to have bodies that glow and and and, and uh, you know according to the science of biophotonics all dna emits, absorbs and emits light. So I can only wonder what the rest of creation is going to do when we are in the age to come. I mean, I just, I don't know. Is the, is the grass going to be greener? Is it going to glow kind of, mm -hmm. kind of this green? I, I don't know. Maybe. I mean, you know, God knows. I, I don't know exactly. I, I, I suspect, suspect maybe, but I think the enemy who has a knowledge of what it used to be like before the fall and you know probably a, a decent inkling of what it's going to be like uh, in the age to come is using those things he's using man's deep rooted desires and he's sort of hanging these out as a carrot saying hey come on over here i'll give you this stuff and you don't have to go through the cross i'll give you this stuff for free just come over here and bow down to me but really what people are doing is they are throwing themselves into utter slavery yeah. when they do that. When God says, hey, I paid the price for you. I will give you that stuff for free. All you need to do is come and confess your sins and it's yours. You'll become an heir. You'll become a co-heir with Christ. I'm gonna bless you beyond what you can even imagine. You're gonna be a partaker of the divine nature. You're gonna awake in my likeness. You know, you don't. we don't know what we're gonna be like, but when he appears, we're gonna be like him. You're going to be conformed to his glorious body. All these things that scripture tells us are ours. If we'll just come to the Lord and say, Lord, I have blown it. I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me? I'm crying out for your mercy. And he says, yes, 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 come, come. I'll forgive you and enter into the joy of the Lord. Yeah. And it, it's just, it's exciting, you know, for those who will receive it, for those who will say, yes, Lord, you know, I, I accept what you give. I, I confess that I've blown it. Thank you for doing this. But it's so sad and tragic for those that will not bend their knee and those that are deceived into believing the lie of the enemy. And, uh, you know, that, again, this is why I just see that the time is short. and We have a, a tremendous amount of work to do Amen. before the, the, the age is up. Yeah, my friend, we got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. Something that, that um, you know, I'd read it, but I never really understood it. And I was teaching out of the book of Revelation for the first time, oh, about six months ago. And uh, talking about the New Jerusalem and the fact that there is no sun because God is there. And the light of God. And it just, it, it made me smile. It gave me this this quiet joy. It made me wonder 
and it made me wonder just with awe you know imagine being in a place where there's no need of a sun because god is there and god's presence will will illuminate everything i mean that 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 was that was tough to get my head around but by the same token it was like wow this is gonna be so cool mm. yeah and uh I'm hoping that will be the topic of my next book, <laughs> uh, the New Jerusalem and such. I've already started compiling cool. uh, about 15 pages of notes. Neat. But uh, well, the new oh, book—it's exciting. Uh, the new book, I should tell you, is corrupting the image. It's available at bookstores and Amazon and places like that. You can go to Doug. Can you order it right off the website? Well, at the moment, they can sign up to be notified because okay. it's still about two weeks away from from uh, being in print but uh, they can also go to Amazon if they want to get a uh, you know they can pre-order the book okay so the new book so I, I misunderstood out. I thought the new book yeah. was going to be out this week it's not out not yet okay it's it's very very close okay yeah, it's very close and uh, chances and the, are it'll be out before the rapture okay so uh, but yeah it's probably about two weeks away and uh, I just got word from from Tom Horn my publisher uh, that he said it's you know a couple weeks, uh, so God willing, it'll be about you know another two weeks or so. But um, yeah, they can sign up to be notified, or they can they can pre-order it at Amazon. And I don't know where else uh, you know Tom's going to put it, but uh, I understand he's going to be at, at quite a few bookstores. So um, yeah, so that's that's the new book, uh, and then a book I'm you know contemplating in the future. <laughs> It will be on the uh, the millennium. Uh, I think there's a lot that that can be explored uh, there as well. And, and I was even thinking about throwing it into the, my current book, but I thought, well, I probably should stop at some point. It's getting pretty thick, you know. But um, you know, again, it it all goes back to to this image of God of how He created us, uh, you know, who He is, and then what He what He created us to look like. Mm -hmm. And you know, something I haven't I haven't touched on yet, but what I believe. That Adam looked like, and I, I essentially see the age to come, or what we would call heaven, is a return to how things used to be, but maybe sort of like a return 2.0 or something like that. You know, it's 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 like how it used to be, but even better than that. And what I what I glean from from the pages of Scripture and from ex, extra biblical sources. Uh, and of course, from what we're going to look like in the end, according to the Bible, we're going to have these bodies of light, uh, bodies that emit light, I should say. Um, I, I really believe that, uh, that Adam and Eve were emitting light uh, before the fall. And so I, I base that on a number of things. Uh, first of all, what we're going to look like when we come into our new bodies uh, also, the fact that angels emit light. We've got lots of passages that speak to that reality. Uh, angels have a very similar appearance to God. We find that in Daniel uh, chapter 7, chapter 10, Ezekiel chapter 1, Matthew 28, Revelation 10, also 22. Uh, sometimes they're even mistaken for God. I mean, John in the book of Revelation bows down to an angel is about to worship this thing and the angel's like no 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 don't do that please you know worship worship god alone thank you and so we um when when we when we consider that and then um when we begin to consider that god it says that god is light and in him is no darkness at all and that god clothes himself with light as with a garment uh, psalm 104 Verse, uh, verse one there, um, that when God created Adam and Eve in his image and in his likeness, I would suggest that Adam before the fall, his biophotons were you know, perfectly uh, suited, just like, just like Moses was emitting light, so too was Adam emitting light before the fall. And when he fell, when he took of that fruit, he, he began to die physically, and he died immediately spiritually. And so this light that was, because he was connected to God, 
uh, I believe they had the Holy Spirit in him at that point. He lost the Holy Spirit and the light began to fade immediately. Now, whether it completely went away or if it you know, took a little bit, but it began to fade immediately. He felt that disconnect. He noticed that there was something different. And it was at that point that he tried to cover himself with something else. And covering himself with something else, of course, was the fig leaves. Because he had been covered. Now, just so that I can make it clear, I don't, when it says that they were naked, I mean, first of all, there's, there's a word play in there. And I, it's a little bit technical in the Hebrew, so I won't get into it um, really. But just suffice it to say that there's a, there's a word play going on with the word naked. But also, it, it's not that they had clothing on, like, like we're wearing clothing. But they were, they had you know, skin just like we do, but it, the, the, the light was coming out of this skin. And then when they sinned, that light began to fade. So that is when they recognized that they, they lost something. And what's really astounding about that is that you have um, several uh, ancient sources that, that make reference to that. It's really confirmed by the um, by the 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 targum the targumim are the Aramaic translations of the uh, Old Testament, and they make reference to this that uh, Adam and Eve used to be covered uh, with a garment of light and glory, and then they lost those, and then uh, later rabbinical sources. Uh, the Zohar would also make reference to that, that uh, Adam was in the Garden of Eden. He was attired in supernal raiment of celestial radiancy, hmm. and that they were, they, were, they were covered with these garments of light. And the rabbis have picked up on this, this wordplay. The word for light in Hebrew is the word or, and the word for skin is the word or. They sound almost identical, but there's a slight difference and how you pronounce those between light and skin. Hmm. And so the rabbis have, have picked up on this little uh, nuance there in, in the scripture so that they were formerly covered with or, with light, and then when they sinned, God covered them with garments of skin or or, and uh, so they were clothed in a different way. So the ancient rabbis picked up on this. The uh, translators of the Targum picked up on this. And, um, and and later mid, uh, rabbinic midrashic literature would also pick up on this as well. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of, of testimony suggesting that they were clothed with light, and that's what they lost. So I see that as how we began, and that's how we're going to end. We're gonna God is going to put all things back the way they were. But what's really astounding is that, you know, we have basically have this 6,000-year hiatus between, you know, the creation and the establishment of the messianic rule and reign on the earth. And, you know, what has been gained in the meantime? Well, we understand the depth to which God was willing to, to go yeah. to save us. We understand the depth of his love. You know, I can only imagine that, had Adam and Eve not sinned, they would have remained pure and enjoyed the, the, the joy of the Lord and, and uh, just being with him, walking with him. Uh, and it would have been blissful. But I suppose they would not have fully grasped how deep his love was. And I see that during these 6,000 years, we have seen how low man can stoop. And yet, uh, how low God is willing to come to, to redeem us from this corruption and decay. And so, you know, we're going to be there not only back in a, in a, in a glorious state, but we're going to be there with the knowledge of what he was willing to do for us. And that is truly, you know, that, <laughs> that's enough to blow your mind right there. So, you know, as you were speaking about Adam and Eve and emitting light and then being aware that they no longer were, 
I, I couldn't help but think of Moses doing basically the same thing where he realized that as the the glow was wearing off, he put the veil on so that people couldn't tell, almost like he too recognized that he was naked. And I I don't know if there's anything there or not, but it just that's sort of where my head went when you were talking. Um, Question that may need uh, more time than than we've got and energy than you want to put into it tonight, but for future reference, a dear friend of mine is in the chat page, and he is a, a very bright man and far more learned than I am. But he says, uh, Vince, could you ask Doug, and maybe this is for a future visit, as a Hebrew scholar, can you teach us a little about the significance of the untranslated word consisting of Hebrew letters Aleph Tov in Genesis 1 1? Yeah. The Hebrew word et. So for, for, yeah. th- for those of us that aren't nearly as well educated as you two guys, if you want to take this on now, first off, could you explain what the heck he's talking about? Yeah, sure. Yeah, the Hebrew word et, it's, it's really just a, a boring grammatical word, and I think it's it's sort of been built up to be something that it's not. Uh, you know, there's a, a very popular uh, Bible commentator, and, and I, I don't want to uh, name him, because I, I do respect him, but <laughs> I would suggest that he's wrong on this one point. But he, he suggests that, uh, that the word et, the Hebrew word et, which consists of the aleph and the taf, is a sort of a, um, a a veiled word for Jesus. And you find it in Genesis chapter 1, where it says that Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. So in the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Um, and he says, you know, that is a reference to Jesus because Jesus is the Aleph and the Taf. He's the Alpha and okay. the Omega. Okay. Put that in the yeah, I've heard this before. Okay, so, I'm with you. Yeah. And... You know, it it sounds all nice, it's all great, but really it's just a boring grammatical term and it doesn't mean what he suggests. And all it all it does is it defines the direct it's a direct object marker. All right. If I say I read the book, I am the subject, read or read is the verb, and the book is the direct object. Hmm. You know, what is the subject doing? He's reading, reading what? The book, okay? Now, if I read the book to my children, my children become the indirect object. Sure. I'm reading the book to them for their benefit, right? So these are just very simple, boring grammatical terms. And that's why I say it's so important that we start with, you know, that simple, boring gram- grammar stuff because that's what everything else is built on. And... You know, if we start looking for things and trying to make the grammar fit with our really cool ideas, we're going to have trouble. So here's a word that in Hebrew, all it does is it tells you that the word that comes after it is a direct object. So it can be used for good things, for bad things, for boring things, for new things, for old things. It has nothing to do with theology. It has everything to do with grammar. And so if you go and you, you do a search on that word, what you're going to find is that it's all over the place and it's used for practically every situation that you could possibly think of. I mean, it's just the most uh, mundane kind of word you can possibly imagine. And it has nothing to do at all with what this, this popular commentator and others have uh, tried to make it out to be. Got it. So I, I hope that uh, answers the question and <laughs> maybe lays that to rest because it, it really doesn't do anything at all. It, like I said, it's used for good people, it's used for bad people, and everybody in between. Well, uh, last question for you before we let you slip away. Were Adam and Eve saved? Were they saved? Uh, well, you know, I think the word saved is a little bit misleading in the Old Testament. Um, but let's put it this way. Were they looking for the coming of the Messiah? Were they looking for the coming of the promised one? Sure. For the seed of the woman? You bet. Yes, they were. Yeah, they definitely were. Because this question and came up about a week ago, and I figured, I'm going to ask you, will Adam and Eve be in eternity? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I, ha- I have no doubt whatsoever. 
I have no doubt whatsoever. The age-old question uh, has been answered. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, they were given the promise in Genesis 3.15, I will cause enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So here is a promise given in the, you know, it's given specifically to Satan, but it's in earshot of, uh, you know, Adam and Eve. And, you know, at one point, Eve says, hey, look, at I've gotten a son uh, by the Lord. So she actually thinks that uh, Seth is the fulfillment, uh, or actually Cain is the fulfillment uh, of that promise. Mm -hmm. well, obviously, he wasn't. But, um, you know, as far as she's concerned, this he could be. So she definitely had taken that to heart and began looking for this coming one. Of course, not realizing it's going to take 6,000 years, well, 4,000 years until he comes and roughly 6,000 until he, he comes back. But, um, yeah, I mean, again, someone who is saved, quote unquote, is anybody who has ever put their hope in the promised Redeemer. And they didn't have to have all the theological nuts and bolts that support that. Just that basic, simple, childlike hope, faith, whatever you want to call it, that God would send a Redeemer to set us straight and that he is our only hope. That's what, I mean, that's really the basic, the, the, the basics of, of what it is to be a believer. And so at the, the, the resurrection, which happens, the first resurrection, which happens at the time of the rapture, all of those Old Testament saints, all the way from Adam until John, are going to be resurrected slightly before us, you know, maybe just, you know, a few nanoseconds, uh, before we are taken up or caught up and transformed and we get our new bodies. And, of course, that raises another question. What, are they, what body do they have right now? I don't think they have any body. I, I think that they are... Uh, in a sense, they're without a body. They're a soul without a permanent body. I mean, maybe they have like a temporary, I don't know, but, uh, you know, rent a body or something like that. But, uh, you know, they're essentially, they're not in their glorified bodies just yet, but they will get that at the, the first resurrection. Well, brother, uh, this has been so good. I let you roll on an extra almost hour here. So you need to spend a little time with your family. You have been unbelievably gracious. So thank you. Please, will you fire me an email as soon as the book is out so I can let people know? I certainly will. Yes, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We breed Bernese Mountain Dogs, and it would appear that one of them has gotten a little feisty in behind me here. So I'm going to take a commercial <laughs> break and deal with my dog. And then we'll finish the night off. Doug, thanks so much for doing this. And uh, we'll, if we don't talk to you before, we'll talk to you in about a month's time. Okay. God bless you. All right, buddy. Bless you. Thank you.